Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, and for those of you who are going to be watching the recording, uh, I am going to say, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please follow me on Odyssey. I'm going to add the Odyssey link. Um, I mean, it seems like people are moving to Odyssey, and also, I like a, I like the uh, you know whole crypto aspect, and I think that this Odyssey thing is really going to take off. And I, and I know. For people who watch uh, Keith Woods, who I definitely recommend watching, um, he talks about how the whole crypto aspect makes it so it's appealing to content creators outside of a right-wing sphere. So that's the main thing with uh, the main problem with things like BitChute is that you're only getting, you know, QAnon people <laughs> and uh, and not uh, just your normal, you know, PewDiePie type video game content creators, and that's going to make it so. Uh, it really limits your audience, limits your market. Whereas, you know, if more people are drawn to Odyssey because it's just a better platform, you're going to get uh, a lot more um, normie type people, you know, and expose your content to a lot more, a lot more people than you would otherwise. All right. But uh, moving on to actual content, uh, outline of sanity. So this is part two um, for anybody who saw the first part. Um, and I think this, he gets into a lot more stuff regarding his philosophy, uh, both economically, on technology, and, uh, uh, yeah, and, and just the best way of, you know, framing society uh, in that sense. So, uh, I do want to make one quick comment. It is kind of funny how almost all of our readings seem to come back to this um, anti-technological aspect, which this one had a very big thrust on. Um, and I know our last reading was Man and Technics, which... I wouldn't say it was explicitly anti-technology, but did have some some definite sentiment with that regard. Whereas this one, I would say, is very explicitly anti-technology. Um, but um, a very interesting perspective on that that I, that I really liked. So what is distributism? Um, well, if I'm going to summarize it in my own words, I would say it is placing the idea of human dignity above economic productivity. Right, and it was the best way to maintain human dignity. Well, that is going to be a return to the land, right? To actually cultivate um, the land that you live on, and to produce goods for yourself, and be uh, both a producer and a consumer of your land, right? Because right now, uh, I don't remember who originally said this, but they said one of the, the main alienating aspects of society is we don't produce what we consume, and we don't consume what we produce, which is alienating. It alienates you from each other and it alienates you from the land and you're just ultimately going to be a less happy individual than if you are producing and consuming all at once. Um, so that's one of the main thrusts of distributism, distributism and what is being distributed is land, right? He wants this idea of bringing back a, uh, a peasantry, right? Move people out of the cities to the land, have them provide for themselves and slowly start to deconstruct um, kind of industrial system that we see, right? Move people out of the factories and into the fields. And he has a various reasonings for why that's uh, important. Um, and I would say personally, one thing that I don't think he touched on that I think he should have, that maybe he does later, that I am going to say that I think is very important is if you are any kind of a, uh, you know, nationalistic minded person, um, you realize that a, a people is tied to the land. And as your economy moves you away from the land, stuffs you into cities, and you leave, uh, you know, things like farming up to, you know, massive uh, industrial corporations that is alienating. You are alienating yourself from your land, and you're, uh, it's, no, it's no doubt that you're going to become a less nationalistic people you're going to be less conservatively minded. You're going to be more uh, globalistic just because of the consequences of that, right? That That is unavoidable if you are going to move to the city. And so what I think distributism accomplishes, the things like um, uh, Italian fascism or national socialism or any of those other third position ideas don't, is they're still very industrial. Right, they they don't really talk about moving people back to the land. They um, want to move people more into the factories, even. Um, and and no matter what, as long as you have industrialization, you're going to continue this path of alienation, and it, it is very antithetical to nationalism. So I think agrarianism 
is a truer form of nationalism than either fascism or national socialism is. Um, and, and that's an opinion, and you can obviously disagree with that. But, you know, after reading about distributism, I think this really hits a lot of the, the issues um, with third position, right? It, it's, it's a more uh, rational and realistic version of third position in a philosophical standpoint. Maybe it's totally irrational to think that everybody's just going to move back to the, the land. Uh, and you can have your opinions on that. But I would say as far as this uh, principle of maintaining human dignity, which is um, Chesterton's whole approach, I think it is much more satisfying than either of those two philosophies. Uh, so that's my, you know, short spiel on distributism and what exactly it is. Uh, but we're going to look at the text and look at some of the quotes here that I, that I appreciated. So the first one was in chapter 3, so we read chapter 3 until the end for this week. So uh, he says, A man in England might live on the land if he did not have to pay to the landlord, if he did not have rent to pay to the landlord, and wages to pay to the laborer. He would therefore be better off, even on a small scale, if he were his own landlord and his own laborer. So this goes back to what I was talking about, you know, you're not producing what you're consuming, and you're not uh, consuming what you're producing. And even in this sense, you're, uh, it's even worse than that, right? You, you're not an owner of the land that you're not even working on, right? You know, we, uh, there's plenty of uh, modern sentiment that is anti-landlord, but I think this really hits the nail on the head. If you are not the ownership, if you, if you're not the owner of your own land, you are literally lacking ownership, and that is going to alienate you from the land. And, and land is is not just a it's not just a material thing. It is a transcendental thing, right? It is there's a, a a tie to the land, right? People are tied to the land on which they cultivate. Um, so if you have this middleman in between that, that is a landlord, that is alienating, and it is going to uh, it is destructive towards human dignity. And then on the second half of that is if you do own the land and you're not working it yourself and you're paying somebody else to work it for you, that is equally alienating, right? You're not seeing the fruits of your labor. You are not actually the one that is contributing to the, the uh, cultivation of the land. You are not being a creator. You are not giving anything back to your country, to your land. And that is just as alienating as anything else. <clears throat> so one of the easiest ways that distributism has to return to this is just cut out the middleman. Uh, no more landlords, no more laborers. You own the land that you are on, and you work the land that you are on. And, uh, I mean, it's a pretty simple solution to a problem that we see is quite complex. Um, and so next quote, uh, I know it is said, that a man must find it monotonous to do the 20 things that are done on a farm. Whereas, of course, he always finds it uproariously funny and festive to do one thing hour after hour and day after day in a factory. And I think this really hit the nail on the head. Um, people really look down on farm life um, and see it as, you know, boring, monotonous. Is it any less boring or monotonous than sitting at a desk and clicking away all day? Is it more monotonous than answering phones and customer service? Is it more monotonous than uh, uh, working at a factory and just pressing um, the same button repeatedly? Uh, it's it's absolutely not. <laughs> um, and if I guess if you're given the choice of being bored in the fields or being bored in a closet, cubicle, <laughs> closeted cubicle, um, I would obviously choose to be in the fields. Um, and I guess this is one of the things that, I don't know why it's so hard for people to understand, that, that you're already miserable. Uh, what would you have to lose by trying to be miserable in a more natural environment full of fresh air, trying to actually uh, you know, produce something for yourself rather than producing something for a you know, multinational corporation that you will never actually see uh, the fruits of? So that was a really... Uh, a really concise and clear quote, which is what, what I like about Chesterton's writing, is he is a he he does have a certain clarity and humor that um, it just reframes ideas in a in a very uh, a very easy to understand way. I would say. <clears throat> uh, 
And so uh, next section I highlighted was, uh, at present we have education, not indeed for angels, but rather for aviators. They do not even understand a man's wish to remain tied to the ground. There is in their ideal an insanity that may truly be called unearthly. Um, and so this was talking about um, how through education and culture, we are constantly aiming beyond the earth. And even now that's become literal, right? We, we are trying to go to space. And this, this kind of returns to a lot of things I said with, with uh, Faustian spirit earlier. And we're trying to get off the earth when really we should be pointed towards the earth, right? There's so much here that we can discover and find um, actualization through. And we're just totally ignoring that. And he's saying that that is literally unearthly, right? It is unearthly to be more concerned about the stars than to be concerned about the own uh, the ground that you are walking on and the land that you live on. <clears throat> so, uh, once again, we need to fix this, right? It has to be a return to the land, and also a uh, a respect for the land, because we 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 do have a disrespect for anybody who is, you know, an agriculturally minded person. This is a small anecdote, but I thought this was interesting. Um. I had a friend, he went to a big Midwest school, and uh, he was a business major. I remember talking to him after a few years. Uh, the business the business um, school was very, very competitive. So he was saying he might drop from business into agribusiness. And he said that that was sort of shameful, right? Agribusiness was for all the people that, uh, you know, couldn't cut it in business. Um, you know, they would go, you know, learn the business of you know, industrial agriculture, which, I mean, obviously industrial agriculture is very different than the agra agrarian uh, philosophy that Chesterton is talking about. But it still just shows the general, um, we, we look down upon anybody involved in agriculture, just that word kind of, uh, it, it's shameful to us. Anybody who is a farmer is going to own a farm, any country bumpkin, some uh, rube, we, we have all these, you know, disparaging ideas of anybody involved in agriculture and uh which is quite sickening actually i mean i mean these are the people who are most tied to the land <laughs> it just shows how alienated that we've become that these are the people the last people that have any tie to the land that we live on and the people who are literally providing us with our life they, they're giving us the food that we eat for our survival and we would dare look down on them it's pretty pretty incredible that it's gotten to that point <clears throat> uh and so the next section, uh, something may be allowed for a social type that would always prefer cinemas and picture postcards even to property and liberty. But there is nothing conclusive in the fact that people prefer to go without property and liberty with a cinema to going without property and liberty without a cinema. Some people may like the town so much that they would rather be sweated in the town than free in the country. But nothing is proved by the mere fact that they would rather be sweated in the town than sweated in the country. I believe, therefore, that if we created even a considerable patch of peasantry, that patch would grow. People would fall back on it as they retired from the de their declining trades. At present, the patch is not growing, because there is no patch to grow. People do not even believe in its existence, and can hardly believe in its extension. Um, so, I don't know if you follow that, but the, to summarize, he's saying that... Uh, in the city, we are basically slaves. You know, we do monotonous jobs that are boring and breaking our spirits. Um, and so we imagine that if we just move out to the country and did the same back-breaking monotonous labor, that um, we wouldn't uh, be any better off, right? But he's saying that's because in either scenario, you're looking at a person who has a lack of freedom and lack of property and no ownership of their own life, right? So if you move out to the country and you have your own property, and you have, you know, a means to provide for yourself, that is so freeing and would be preferential for many people than the slavery that we're seeing in the cities, right? And so even though, you know, agrarian life might be monotonous, it is still, uh, it's very fulfilling, right, in this spiritual, metaphysical way. Um, and so the fact that, you know, either way, in the current system, you know, if you're going to go rent property out on the farm or rent property in the town, you're probably going to choose the town because at least you have distractions here. You know, you can go to the bar, you can go to the movies. Um, and that is, uh, you know, obviously that's going to give a leg up over the town when life is 
you know, slavery either way. Where he's saying if you could have the opportunity to not be a slave, and if it means moving to the country, then you're going to want to move to the country. Um, and obviously some people are going to still choose to remain slaves in the town, but he said those are, you know, they're going to be your outliers, the people not worth really considering. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, some pretty interesting stuff there. Uh, all right, so next section, I believe this was in the next chapter. Oh, actually, no, it's not. <laughs> but he says, uh, there will be many who maintain that this would mean a very dull life compared with the excitements of dying in a workhouse in Liverpool. Just as there are many who insist that the average woman is made to drudge in the home without asking whether the average man exults in having to drudge in the office. So, once again, he's talking about, you know, you can go die in a factory or you could, you know, work the fields, you know, and people act like working in the fields is the absolute worst possible thing you could do. And, you know, dying in a meatpacking plant is much more disgusting and much less uh, fulfilling overall. <clears throat> But I do want to say the one thing he says about this, uh, you know, man drudging in the office versus woman uh, drudging in the, the kitchen, right, in the home. Uh, the idea of agrarianism is actually kind of appealing from uh, a women's rights perspective. And I, uh, I'm going to elaborate on this. So I've, I've argued with some people saying how, uh, you know, having women in the workplace is bad for society, right? Because, I mean, really all it did was drive down wages and force it so that we had to have double income households, so less children, it's much easier, I mean, it's much harder to buy a house, it's much harder to have a family, and ultimately we fucked up the economy, uh, fucked up the economy by allowing women into the workplace. And some people will, they will totally uh, agree with this. They will say, yep, we, we, I mean, things are so much worse off than they were, but it is worth it because we have given women independence, right? So they are free from their husbands. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure you have your opinions on this, and I have opinions on that that I won't really get into. But um, I guess that is, you know, a certain valid argument for a certain type of person. But I think this totally, uh, you know, it totally defeats that argument, right? Because if if you're going to go even further back into this agrarian type of society, there's nothing stopping a woman from having her own farm and working in the fields herself, right? I mean, so if you want uh, at least the option to be independent as a woman, uh, the agrarian lifestyle surely allows for that, more so than, you know, a 1920s style uh, industrialism that a lot of, you know, fascist types lean towards. So I think this agrarian um, lifestyle is much more appealing to both sides of the spectrum in that sense. Uh, I don't know. You might have other thoughts on that, but that's just something I was thinking about. Uh, okay, so moving on from there, uh, we talked about women. Um, okay, now... We said, he said, if we can make men happier, it does not matter if we make them poorer. It does not matter if we make them less productive. It does not matter if we make them less progressive in the sense of merely changing their life without increasing their liking for it. Uh, and so once again, so clearly and concisely says what I think so many people are missing. And when you talk about capitalism, right, we talk about productivity, productivity, uh, you know, GDP, all of this. Meanwhile, you look at happiness indexes are just going way down. And we, we call this progress. We say that we're moving forward just because, you know, we watch the number go up. Meanwhile, nobody is actually happy, especially women, um, if, you, if you look at those statistics. Uh, so what exactly are we doing this for, right? Um, aren't we supposed to see a greater quality of life increase with productivity? Um, and so now that we don't have this one-to-one -one correlation, we really need to ask ourselves, why are we producing then? You know, why don't we try something different? Why don't we try something radical? Why don't we put people's happiness first and stop worrying about productivity? And that's the whole idea here of distributed distributism. We are putting 
human dignity above all. And human dignity comes from ownership and providing for yourself, right? And those are the two things that are creating human dignity. Um, and this is the kind of thing, and I know, you know, plenty of people have read uh, Industrial Society and Its Future. And I mean, this is almost the solution to Kaczynski's presented problem, right? I mean, he talks about uh, mankind having a lack of purpose. Well, this is how you give purpose back. You know, if you actually do need to fight to survive in a certain sense. Um, I mean, of course, I mean, Kaczynski talked about dismantling industrial society, which is obviously uh, an aspect of distributism. But I just think, you know, if, if he wasn't so radical, I think, you know, somebody like Kaczynski would see distributism as a, a very valid uh, solution to the problems presented to us. And uh, maybe not radical enough, but at the very least, it's realistic, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, that's one of the reasons I, I'm really drawn to this philosophy. And I, I mean, I would, after reading this, I would probably have to say, I would consider myself a distributist. I would say this is the kind of thing that I've been, I mean, you, you watch these episodes, I talk about, you know, trying to return to a kind of agrarian lifestyle. And I think this is exactly it. <laughs> you need to produce on your own land and worry about everything else secondarily, right? This is, the, your primary goal is going to be uh, your own production. <clears throat> All right, so another quote from chapter four. It was a pretty large one, so get ready. It says, yes, and it would be better for people like you if it were still a luxury. Oh, and uh, some context to this, what he's talking about is a glass window, literally just a glass window, and how this used to be such a, an interesting thing. You know, you saw a glass window, it was mystifying. You know, there was actually a time before glass was widespread. Um, obviously, in Chester, at the time of Chester, Chesterton's writing, it was widespread, but he's talking about how quickly it went from being um, something magical to something totally taken for granted. So he says, yes, and it would be better for people like you if it were still a luxury if that would induce you to look at it, not only to look through it. Do you ever consider how magical a thing is, that invisible film standing between you and the birds and the wind? Do you ever think of it as water hung in the air, or a flattened diamond too clear to be valued? Do you ever feel a window as a sudden opening in a wall? And if you do not, what is the good of glass to you? And uh, I skipped a section and then said, Humanity has not got the good out of its own inventions and by making more and more inventions it is only leaving it leaving its own power of happiness further and further behind uh and i thought this was a great section and so just talking about glass right it goes from totally magical to being totally taken for granted um and that was a long time ago and you look at how quickly things happen today i mean how much do we take smartphones for granted i mean you literally have a supercomputer in your pocket and you can't live without it, right? It's no longer, it no longer benefits your life when it becomes something you can't live without. It is no longer a life enhancer. It is a life support, right? Um, and this happens so quickly. You know, it, it, there's like a nice time frame window of when a new invention is super cool and novel. And it's like less than a year before it's totally uh, ubiquitous and you can't escape from it and you're now totally tied to it. Um, and I remember when I, when I was young, I used to like watching Louis CK. If you ever watch him, uh, I know, you know, plenty of people probably have opinions on him as well, but he had a very funny bit. He talked about, he was on a plane and, uh, this is before, you know, they had Wi-Fi on all the planes and, uh, the voice on the intercom says, Hey, we're starting a, we're offering a, a prototype for our in-flight Wi-Fi, and we're going to give you all like a free sample of it, you know, the, an opportunity to try out this in-flight Wi-Fi, and everybody's like, oh, cool, um, and so it's going really well, you know, 15 minutes into the flight, everybody's on their phones and watching, you know, videos and everything, and then uh, all of a sudden it goes down, and there's a voice over the intercom, it says, we're sorry, uh, but uh, we're having technical difficulties, we're going to have to suspend the, the in-flight Wi-Fi trial, and Louis C.K. says, the guy next to him, he's like, fucking bullshit. He's like, this is bullshit. I can't believe they do. He's like, you literally were only exposed to this new thing 15 minutes ago. And already 
you are upset that it has been taken from you. It, it just shows how quickly we adapt to novelty, right? We, we take everything for granted and any new, uh, new invention, you know, it takes, it takes so short of a time for us to not even care about it. And at that point, it's not improving your life. And that's the whole thing. If you don't notice it, you only notice it when you're without it. It is not actually improving your life. It is, it is uh, dominating your life, right? And I even talk about, you know, talk to your grandparents, you know, ask them, you know, how life was different before email or anything like that, um, or how life was different before television. Um, and they were perfectly happy, right? Television didn't actually increase their happiness, right? It just became so ubiquitous that you don't even notice it anymore. But the thing is, humanity has the ability to be happy without technology. And the more technology we have and the more control it has over us, the less we actually have the ability to find happiness from ourselves, which is exactly the thing that Chesterton is talking about here. He says, it is only leaving behind its power of happiness further. It is leaving its own power of happiness further and further behind it being humanity. Um, and yeah, we have our own power, right, to uh, be happy. And uh, we're leaving that behind. And he captures that very well. <clears throat> uh, so next note, got to pull it up here. Uh, okay, so now this is still chapter four. Um, he says, for the moment, I will leave the progressive to laugh at my absurd notion of the limitation of machines and go off to a meeting to demand the limitation of armaments. Uh, so that was pretty funny. He's talking about, you know, the your progressive leftist will talk about how, you know, we need nuclear, uh, we need to reduce the amount of nuclear arms, right? This disarmament treaties and such like that. So they will totally think that it is reasonable to scale back one certain type of technology. But if you said something like, maybe we should scale back television, maybe we should scale back the internet, they would say, it's laughable, it's impossible. There's no way uh, that it could be done. And uh, Chesterton had a whole section dedicated to this one phrase, uh, the word here to stay. It would say, television is here to stay. The internet is here to stay. And he says, what does this mean? This is a totally empty phrase. Um, he said, if you had an uncle, and you said, Uncle Phil is here to stay, um, that means so many different things than it does when you're talking about technology, right? He said, if you told me Uncle Phil was here to stay, as in the fact that he was going to live in my house and eat all of my food, and there's nothing I could do about it, um, and I could never kick him out, uh, I would be pretty pissed about that. And the fact that you would even consider that a possibility um, would just be absurd. And he says, well, this is the exact mentality that people have regarding technology when they say it's here to stay. They say it's just going to suck away your life and there's nothing that you can do about it and there's no solution here. Um, and that's just the only word they have. They say here to stay and that's uh, as much as they'll say. They won't say why it's here to stay. Here to stay. They won't say, uh, you know, why it's good that it can't be removed. They'll just say that it's unfeasible. Um, and then the irony here is that he's saying they'll say that about any other technology other than weapons, because they'll say weapons can totally be scaled back. We can have disarmament treaties, and that's perfectly realistic. Uh, meanwhile, we would probably be a lot happier and healthier if instead of scaling back nukes, we scaled back television. Um, but, uh, you know, that's just an opinion. Uh... And then one last uh, one from chapter four, he says, I think that even the slavery of his labor, even the slavery of his labor would be light compared to the grinding slavery of his leisure. And this was another great thing uh, in regards to um, town life versus rural life. So your rural life is, uh, I mean, it's obviously a difficult life. You know, you're toiling away in the fields. Meanwhile, your city life, the real 
pain comes from your downtime. Well, not to say that your work isn't also uh, soul destructive, um, but your when your downtime is just sitting in front of a screen, um, slack jawed and glass eyed, uh, drool coming out of your mouth as you watch the next show or play video games or or even if you're just you know going from bar to bar, I mean, is that really a healthy lifestyle? I mean, really, you're just you are just a slave. You know, freedom is not the ability to watch Avengers or watch Harry Potter. You know, freedom is the ability to um, go outside and have your own land and um, be able to supply your own food without the need of a government, without the need of um, relying on other people. That is what freedom is. Um, and the true slavery is this, you know, the monotonous, repetitive life of living in a town rather than living in the country. Uh, and he really captures that in this single sentence. Um, so yeah, another thing to think about when we talk about, you know, modern slavery and uh, what it's like to live in industrialism. <laughs> um, so that's the last note I had on chapter four. Moving on to chapter five. Chapter five was a little bit not that useful. I mean, I was talking about emigration, which I think is less relevant talking about this today because obviously he's writing from England which is a small country and he says in order for everyone to return to the land they're going to have to move out to the colonies he talks about uh, you know uh, Canada and uh, well the United States at that point you know former colony um, but I think most of us are US based and um, especially you know dissident types um, US has plenty of land so we don't need to worry about uh, having to emigrate uh, right this second in order to, you know, have enough land for everybody. So, yeah, this is a pretty, I mean, not that super relevant chapter, but there was some interesting stuff. Uh, so this is one quote I really liked. I think this is the only highlight I had from this chapter. But he says, There cannot be a nation of millionaires, and there has never been a nation of utopian comrades, but there have been an, a number, there have been any number of nations of tolerably contented peasants. So once again, in one sentence, he, he says something uh, with a whole lot of clarity that a lot of people aren't understanding. You know, they say in capitalism, everybody uh, sees themselves as a um, as a future millionaire, right? Uh, which is just totally unrealistic. You can't have a nation of millionaires. Not everybody can be rich. Not everybody can win a lottery. And naturally, some people are going to be at the bottom and others are going to be at the top. And we just think in, in some ideal version of capitalism, that's going to change. And uh, if anything is shown, that that's a completely unrealistic way of viewing things. Um, similarly, we have, you know, the communist uh, who thinks that uh, everybody is going to be um, brought down to this median level. Um, everybody's going to have the same amount. Uh, everybody's going to be fed. Everybody's going to do the same amount of labor which is equally as unrealistic um, and unrealistic just from a, a human nature standpoint, right? It just doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I shouldn't have to argue against communism to you guys, but, um, you know, that's just the, the understanding here is that you can't have uh, this communist utopia, but in the same way, you can't have a capitalist utopia. You're not going to have a nation of millionaires. So these two visions that, you know, modernists had, this ideal capitalism and ideal communism, both of them, are totally unrealistic. Whereas what is realistic is peasantry, right? <laughs> For thousands and thousands of years, you had an agrarian populace that were totally content to live that life, right? Because it was satisfying, it was fulfilling, and it had freedom and dignity. Uh, meanwhile, today, people will look at the peasant, right, the farmer, and say that that life is undignified, say that it was um, totally uh, not... Uh, I mean, it's totally not uh, the way of life, right? It is not a good way of life. Meanwhile, history, history tells us otherwise, right? It is 100% a good way of life, a fulfilling way of life, etc. And uh, that's just how twisted things have gotten in this modern era, that we think that communism is somehow more uh, feasible than agrarianism. Uh, so yeah, that was my one note on chapter, chapter 5. And chapter six, he just uh, summarizes a lot of his ideas. 
um, you know, regarding capitalism versus communism and then overall distributism. Um, but here's a quote here. He says, they believe in unity and unanimity and harmony. One of these powers is state socialism and the other is big business. They are already one spirit. They will soon be one body. For disbelieving in division, they cannot remain divided. Believing only in combination, they will themselves combine. At present, at present, one of them calls it solidarity, and the other calls it consolidation. So, uh, in this way, he kind of shows how, you know, a pure capitalism, pure communism really aren't all that different, right? Either way, they want everything to be combined under one entity, whether that entity is a private monopoly or the public state. And in reality, they're both going to look identical. And uh, you even kind of start to see this today, uh, which, you know, you could argue is due to different factors, but you, you have corporations that are literally, uh, you know, communist, sympathize, communist sympathizing, right? They will uh, prop up uh, these Marxist kind of ideas. And why exactly is that? Because they kind of go hand in hand, right? If the corporation becomes one with the government, you basically have communism, right? If we're all under one corporation, forced to work for this singular corporation, the singular corporation is providing us our food, how is that different from working for the one state and having the state provide us our food? It's really not that different at all. And you're kind of seeing this um, today, you know, with, you know, global homo woke capitalism. It is kind of uh, taking on these Marxist characteristics, despite the fact that it is capitalism. And we're starting to see these these lines start to break down. And, and this is something that, you know, Spengler talked about, and I think uh, Evola as well. Realistically, communism is the final stage of capitalism rather than its antithesis, right? Because it's still so focused on capital, it's still focused on money, rather than, um, you know, moving past it into something like, you know, happiness and virtue, like distributism it is... Um, just trying to more uh, bring everybody into that system, bring everybody under one tent of uh, domination, one tent of control, one tent of labor. And uh, that's how, you know, communism and capitalism, uh, they have a lot more in common than we initially think. And uh, I think Chesterton does a good job of outlining that. <clears throat> um so I got two more quotes here, if you bear with me. So, there is no longer any difference in tone and type between collectivist and ordinary commercial order. Commerce has its officialism and communism has its organization. Private things are already public in the worst sense of the word. That is, they are impersonal and dehumanized. Public things are already private in the worst sense of the word. That is, they are mysterious and secretive and largely corrupt. So... Yeah, <laughs> uh, just what I was saying, you know, you have this, this blurring of the lines between what is public and what is private, right? Uh, we look at a private corporation, you know, and I mean, this might be a tired example, but, you know, social media and the amount of control they have over the public, I mean, they're basically a public utility. Um, it's hard to consider them a private company at all. Um, and meanwhile, you look at public things like, you know, the government, the government is so private in its uh, way of conducting itself, right? right? He says, secretive and corrupt. You know, the government may as well be a corporation and how not transparent it is. You know, they could be doing just about anything with your money that you pay taxes to, and uh, there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, and is that, the, is that the ideal of a, of a, a socialist system? I think um, obviously not. So, uh, we have the worst components of both of these things, and they're going to become more and more blended as time goes on. <clears throat> um, so one last quote here from the final chapter. The thing, behind Bolsh <laughs> the thing behind Bolshevism and many other modern things is a new doubt. It is not merely a doubt about God. It is rather specific, specially, rather specially a doubt about man. The old morality, the Christian religion, the Catholic Church, differed from all this new mentality because it really believed in the rights of men. That is, it believed that ordinary men were clothed with powers and privileges and a kind of authority. I think that's a pretty amazing quote. 
um, because it kind of encapsulates this whole idea behind distributism of looking at human dignity and a man having a certain God-given rights and also a God-given authority. And this kind of subverts um, certain um, certain ideas that people have about Christianity. I mean, you know me, I mean, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm Christian sympathetic. Uh, and I do recognize certain uh, criticisms, you know, from your Misha or Evola regarding, you know, slave morality and such things like that. But I think people are really not looking at the depth of um, Christianity here. And he says that it, Christianity actually imbued man with a certain authority, right? Uh, we see as, um, you know, Catholicism, especially as authoritative, right? You're submitting to the church, but in that sense, it is less authoritative because you're submitting to something metaphysical rather than something material. The material is entirely you. You have an authority over your material life to do what you want. You can produce what you want. Well, you should produce what you want. You should, um, you should have ownership. And these are all things that, you know, Christianity, maybe not so much in, you know, you, you might not find, uh, a, a verse in the Bible that is, you know, explicitly distributist in this sense. It is, uh, but it is the, the, they say, um, what is it? It's not the, the letter of the law, but the, you know, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you have this tradition in the church of allowing for this, uh, a level of human dignity that is kind of rejected, um, by secularism. Uh, and, once you abandon that, right, you, a man no longer has a transcendent, transcendent value as a man. He no longer has these God-given rights. Um, you also remove his authority over his own life. Um, and that's one of the things that uh, we have been alienated from as well, when we alienate ourselves from land and also from religion. And I think that, you know, wraps it all together in why distributism is a Catholic ideology, a Christian ideology, because it's, it is very much resting on these ideas of personal freedom, personal authority, and individualism that are left behind in any kind of a uh, global interconnected industrial system like either capitalism or communism. Uh, so on that note, I think I finished everything that I'd like to talk about. Um, I do want to address one comment that uh, Casey has made here. He says, the takeaway from chapter 5 was the multi-generational success of Catholic, French Canadians, and Irish settlers who thrived on frontiers. Chesterton says their faith was central to their continued prosperity on the land. Uh, that's probably 100% correct, right? I'd say you probably had a lot more success with agrarian life um, in America, or North America, not just USA, than with uh, um, in England. <clears throat> uh, and then Funky Clock says, do you think distributism could be incompatible, or at least not fully compatible, with collectivist nationalist values if it promotes self-reliance and personal freedom? Absolutely not. Um, I mean, this is something I literally was writing about this uh, earlier this week, about how, you know, uh, true individualism can only come from collectivism slash nationalism. Um, because the, the individualism we have today, you know, we've severed all bonds with our fellow men, right? You have no kinship, you have no racial ties, you have no, uh, organizational ties, you know, you have no religion. Um, and therefore, you know, our, our, the extent of our individualism is kind of what I said earlier, do I get to watch Avengers or am I going to watch Harry Potter or maybe I'll just jerk off. Maybe I'll just throw on some pornography or, you know, maybe, maybe I'll even play the newest, newest video game. Um, that's not individualism, right? Individualism is not whether I wear a Slytherin or a Gryffindor shirt. Okay. That is fake commodified individualism. True individualism is only achievable, uh, within a collective. And this might seem counterintuitive, but I explain it. You, you have these bonds that are inescapable, you know, and you have an important duty to your fellow man and to be an individual and to uh, be great. You know, what does it mean to be a great man? 
It means to do something for the collective. It means to provide great works. It means to create great things. And there's no point in creating great works. There's no point in being great if it is not to benefit the collective. Like, what is great art if nobody sees it? What is a great song if no one hears it? Um, And so on that note, to be a true individual, right, that means the freedom to be great, the freedom to create, the freedom to be self-reliant as well, right? And so when I say self-reliant, I mean you are not beholden to other people for survival, but you're still beholden to other people for actualization. I mean, no no man is an island, as they say. It is impossible to, to live solitarily and still be happy, right? You need to find some kind of actualization within other people. So on that note, you kind of need to be a collectivist or a nationalist to be an individual, right? Otherwise, once you remove all of that, once you remove the collective, the individualism that you're left with is just total emptiness, is total, totally vapid. Um, so I hope that answers your question. But absolutely not. Distributivism is not incompatible with nationalism. That is totally false. Um And just think of something, you know, like the the ancient Greeks, right? They were a very agrarian life. I mean, I don't know if you'd call them distributist, but they were totally collective, but they were also totally individualistic, right? You can have, you know, independence of thought, but also a lot of the things that they did were for the greatness of mankind or, you know, even their their community, right? You know, you didn't have these philosophers, um, they were doing things, you know, for their own benefit. They were doing it for the benefit of the group. <clears throat> um, right? So, uh, I mean, that was a pretty great discussion. Um, I guess I'll open up the phone lines and see if anybody uh, is interested in talking. But, uh, yeah, if uh, nobody is, I will probably just end the stream there. But, as always, I will give you the, the chance to talk. Um, Oh, but I guess before I do end the stream, I do want to say one more time, follow on Odyssey. And also for those of you in the, for those of you in the, in the, in the discord, please please read my, please read the the thing that I posted as an essay, because I definitely want to uh, try and submit that to the art, the art, uh, uh, challenge. All right, so we have Casius here. Uh, Casius, you have some thoughts you'd like to share with us? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Casius, there you are. So I said you have some thoughts oh. you, you, you'd like to share with us? Yeah. Um, you kind of brushed on this earlier, but uh, as Americans, we have a lot of land uh, unlike the England that Chesterton was writing from. And uh, I think uh, distributism is a lot more uh, likely to see reality in America than it ever will in England, maybe. Um, I mean, yeah, that's very important to, to bring up. Um, I mean, my visits to England have been very brief. Um, I went once when I was very small. So I really have no conception of, uh, you know, the amount of land it has. Whereas anybody that's been to America, I mean, an acre per person is <laughs> so uh, beyond realistic. I mean, you might be able to do 10 acres per person. I don't know the math, but, uh, I mean, there is so much land. Uh, so, yeah, this might have just been a pipe dream for Chesterton, but for, for Americans, I mean, this could be a very much realistic uh economic and philosophical goal for sure. So with that being said, uh, do you think it's likely this will catch on? I mean, we already see a a kind of a more sustainability movement, especially with food. People want organic produce and uh, more humanely raised meat and all that? Well, I say obviously not. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you're not going to see a massive rush to the fields um, soon. 
Um, and I think, you know, that's just because of this whole, you know, mentality we look down upon farmers and such. Um, with that said, uh, I mean, this is not really like, I mean, there's a pretty easy solution just from a governmental perspective. I mean, the government has the money. You could buy up these industrial farms and then just simply redistribute the land. Um, I mean, I don't really see the government doing that, but I'm just saying it's a very realistic scenario. I mean, instead we have somebody like Bill Gates buying up all of the land, and he's not going to cultivate it. He's going to turn it into an industrial wasteland of soy, probably, um, and further alienate us from the land, because you know now Bill Gates is in charge of our food production, um, instead of industrial farmers who are at least like beholden to the market. Uh, so, I mean, I know you, you talk about you know a, a push for organic foods and the desire for that. But ultimately, uh, you, you need to have an opportunity for that. And land is still so scarce and it's still so inaccessible. I mean, I mean I've even looked into this. I'm like, you know, I would love to buy land and start a farm, but I know so little about it. Um, it would be such a hard adjustment for that lifestyle. You know, I'd have to do, you know, a few more years of research before I'm even close to the level of doing that. So a lot of people aren't willing to take that risk. And I think as far as the way society is set up, I don't really see a mass exodus to the farms at this point. Right. But another point is, is the tributism mutually exclusive to technology at all? Because Chesterton seemed pretty, pretty, uh, he did not have a very good view on technology. Um, well, I think what he says, and I would have to find the exact passage, but he talks about, uh, technology, um, well, he's not going to say that a certain technology, he's not going to say you can't have X technology, but he's going to say, you know, put the person first, you know, move out into the, uh, country and then see what technologies you can do without. And um, obviously, certain technologies are going to, you know, slowly start to disappear after that happens, right? You know, it's going to be unfeasible to have certain things um, in the country, and certain things are not going to be required, right? Maybe you don't need, um, you know, a massive trucking uh, network anymore, you know, and then trucks sort of go out of fashion. Maybe you don't need um, airlines, you know, <laughs> maybe you don't need that. Maybe you don't need these certain things. So I think he was very, you know, he wasn't explicitly anti-technology, but he says, you know, based on the way that this is set up, certain technologies are going to fall out of fashion. They're going to become less used, become irrelevant, but he's never going to say like, absolutely like, you know, well, he didn't have televisions, but he's not saying absolutely no televisions, right? He's not saying that. Uh, so I guess they're not like incompatible. But, uh, in my opinion, realistically, I mean, you'd have to scale back technology to a certain degree for this to be feasible. <clears throat> um, okay, I like when you brought up the, the Ford motor car as, uh, maybe like a kind of yeah, giving power to an individual, even if it is a piece of new technology. And I think the internet is kind of the same thing where we could use it, even if it's just using it to get away from it, right? Using the internet to learn how to get back to the land, which is kind of what I'm trying to do, really. Yeah, and, uh, you know, in the same way, Obviously, the internet is not an absolute evil in the sense that it allows, you know, people like you and me to connect and share ideas. Uh, and, you know, we can gain information that we wouldn't have obtained otherwise. But I guess ultimately the goal is to wean ourselves off of a dependence on that. Right? I mean, you'd probably agree. Uh, to the point where the need for internet and the need for in this type of information and community is only existing because we have removed that type of community from our real lives 
And if we can return to that, the internet would become hopefully irrelevant. Um, well, did you have any other thoughts? Uh, that was about it for me. About it. All right. Well, it doesn't look like anybody else is here, so uh, I'm going to end the recording. And one more time, subscribe on Odyssey and also read my papers. Read my papers. I want to submit them and uh, hopefully get published, um, which would be pretty awesome. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, I'll see you next time. Oh, uh, next uh, for the next two weeks, we're going to be reading... Birth of Tragedy by Nisha. Uh, it's about time. So hopefully this will be a little bit different. Uh, spice things up a little bit. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to learn a lot with that one. And uh, it's kind of pretty accessible, I'd say, for most people. So, you know, might even uh, might even gain a little bit uh, with, the, with an audience. Hopefully. We'll see. Um, but Birth of Tragedy. Uh, we're going to be talking about that the next two weeks. So... Go ahead and read that. Um, other than that, signing off. Uh, thanks for watching.